All right, well, good day. Um, we're going to start a little bit of note-taking about Europe during the Middle Ages. You'll hear the Middle Ages called many different things. Um, the Middle Ages, which a lot of people sometimes don't like because it kind of says that it's this weird nebulous period between two great time periods. Uh, when the Roman Empire was standing and then it kind of ends when we get to the Renaissance and then there's that weird middle period. Um, and so when we're looking at that, we sometimes want to say, well, maybe it's more than just the Middle Ages. And so you'll hear terms like medieval, which might describe it a little bit better than this. So when you're looking at this and we're looking at medieval times or the Middle Ages, we are looking at the period of time between the fall of Rome um, up into the Renaissance. So the Renaissance is going to be in the 14th century, and we'll look at that later. And so Middle Ages will be between the fall of Rome and the Renaissance, or oftentimes just called medieval times. Now during this time, there's going to be a quest for order. Um, it's going to be highly decentralized um, government and systems as kind of overall, um, compared to what we see at also going on during that time. So Byzantium, China in the Islamic world, which we really haven't talked about yet, um, it's going to be very decentralized. It's going to look more backwards. Um, they're not going to have a centralized government that's supported by a bureaucracy. Instead, it's going to remain very decentralized, um, and we're going to enter a period that we often term feudalism, and we'll talk more about that. I believe we talked about that yesterday in class. So we're going to have kind of this quest for political order during this time period. Now, as we've known, we've talked about many a times, uh, the Western Roman Empire fell in 476. Odoacer was kind of the final one that put the nail in the coffin of the Roman Empire, at least in the West. And so during that time, we kind of opened up to a lot of invasions kind of all over by different groups. Many of them are Germanic in their backgrounds. Um, others are going to be more from where you see up on the top of this map. We have different groups up here, such as the Angles and the Saxons. These are going to be other groups that we're going to see are not as Germanic, but a lot of these groups are going to be Germanic groups. And so what we're going to see is Germanic successor states take over and never really have necessarily a centralized rule, um, but they are going to help form our decentralized society that we are going to see in Europe during this time period. And it's going to be very unique and very different than what we've seen before um, with Roman rule. So German chieftains are going to replace Roman rule. Um, Germanic tradition is going to replace Roman law. Um, and what that really looks like is pretty significant. Um, if, let's say, there was a crime in Rome, um, the crime would be against society. So it would be versus society. Oops, you can't really see that. Society. And so when it was against society, we see that So when we're looking at the Roman law, um, where we said it was against society, here we go, versus society, more broom down here with my messy writing, whereas Germanic law, we're going to see, is going to be against the person. So when you're thinking about this, what this means, uh, Roman law would punish them and then put them away from society. Whereas Germanic tradition, when it's against a person, your options are often just revenge and getting back at them. And so um, what we're going to see is we're going to have feuds start between families, um, between different groups. Um, because of different uh, crimes or different events that happened. Something else that's really different about Germanic law versus Roman law is a lot of times, and this will mix in with some Christianity and some of the things they would do, but they would say that we're going to have something called an ordeal. I'll write that term up here. An ordeal. Um, and an ordeal basically means that there is some sort of an event, a physical trial, and that physical trial then will determine the guilt or innocence of a person. 
And so you probably have seen this before in movies and other things, but where um, if you wanted to see if someone was hot, uh, guilty or innocent, maybe you would throw them into a lake, and if they could swim, um, then they were innocent. If they sank, that means they were guilty, and then they would die. Um, or maybe they would uh, take a hot iron to them, and depending on how it would burn them, they would maybe say that they were innocent or guilty. And so it's very interesting, kind of the difference between uh, Germanic law, Roman law. Uh, kind of a funny quote uh, of one of the Germanic laws that existed um, is this kind of quote about hounds or dogs. It says, if anyone shall presume to steal a hound or a hunting dog or a running dog, we order that he be compelled to kiss the posterior of that dog publicly. I'll let you read into that. But uh, so German law, Roman law, very different. Um, and so because of this and because of this kind of feuding, because of no centralized control, peasants are going to turn to local lords. See this? Local lords for safety. Um, and so they need someone to protect them. There isn't a government that exists, and this is where it leads us into the feudal system. Um, Germanic groups are going to stick more so, and this is what's interesting compared to other things, they are going to stick into this central area of Europe um, where they're not going to be as concerned with the Mediterranean and trading down there, but they're going to be more reliant on agriculture and things that they can grow within Europe and then trading within Europe as well and be less concerned with trading on the Mediterranean. And so we're going to see some significant power shifts away from Italy and kind of leading in to Central uh, Europe where we mostly see France today. And so just be aware of some of those things. Um, now there's some major people. The Franks are going to be a major group of people that we're going to be concerned with um, because there's going to be some attempts at having more centralized rule. And so the Franks uh, really influenced politically, socially, culturally, the development of Western Europe specifically. Um, they were the ones that rather than really being involved in the commercial world of the Mediterranean, they really wanted to kind of uh, bank their development on the agricultural resources on the continental um, side of Europe. And so this is why everything kind of shifted away from Italy and shifted into countries like France and Germany and the low countries like the Netherlands. And so um, that's kind of what's going on here. And so the Franks are going to appear kind of as a blip on the map um, in ways that they're going to try to uh, organize again. And Clovis is going to be one of our first people that we're going to talk to in that he's going to be the one, as we kind of look here specifically, that he's going to be the one that united the Franks. He's going to be the one that works to kind of unify this people group. Um, and what he's going to be known for is because of his military and political power in Western Europe, he is going to kind of organize people um, in that way and so that they are able to then kind of take over different areas. So because remember, we have lots of different groups at this time kind of vying for land. And so what he's going to do in 486, he's going to lead Frankish forces on a campaign um, that's going to wipe out a lot of the other powers in Gaul. We know that that's France. And so he's going to do this, and then he's going to kind of kind of organize in a centralized way the Frankish people. And so some of the other interesting things that he's going to do is going to be more specific to what he does um, while he's out on the battlefield. Um, at this time, Franks worshipped other gods. Um, as you kind of note on here that he's going to convert to Roman Catholicism. But at this time, it, originally he wasn't. Um, Franks worshipped other gods, one of them known as Thor, if you haven't seen the movie, just came up. But before he died, um, he actually converted to Roman Christianity, Roman Catholicism. And his conversion was really unique. Um, he was out on the battlefield, and he was praying to kind of their old gods, um, praying for that they would have victory over these other places that he was trying to conquer. Um, and he was not being very successful at all. And so during this time, uh, he prays and remembers, really, that his wife, and it always goes back to those wives that nag their husbands, this wife had been urging him to give up the old Frankish gods and become a Christian. And so out on the battlefield, he determined that he's going to try this out and kind of kind of, threw out this, Oh, Christ Jesus, I beseech thee for aid. 
If thou wilt grant me victory over these enemies, I will believe in thee and baptize in thy name. And, kind of, we know how this goes, they won the victory. And as a result, he became a Christian. More than half of his warriors decided to follow him. Whenever we see kind of a political leader do this, we see that other people followed. And so he really laid the foundation for France. And so that's Clovis the first. Another kind of thing going on during this time, we have to remember this because this will play into the second thing. We haven't talked about this as much, but what is going on as we look here is the development of Islam. And so you kind of see originally 632 is the year where we have the foundation of Islam uh, with Muhammad. We'll talk about that later soon. But then what we're going to see is we're going to see expansion of these beliefs. First, we're going to see it in these years, um, kind of within the Middle East still. But what's more specific I want to look at is what's going to happen under the Umayyad Caliph. And so we're looking at this area over here. And the reason that this area is going to be important is because the Frankish kingdom is over here. And so there is going to be conflict between these two um, different areas. And we're going to look specifically at the next person um, from the Frankish kingdom that is going to have a run-in with um, different Islamic invaders that are going to be coming in um, into the Iberian Peninsula. Remember, whenever we say Iberian Peninsula, we're talking about Spain and Portugal. And you can see during this time period, the Umayyads have control over the Iberian Peninsula. And as we're looking later at this, we're going to see a lot of Islamic influence in this region. So the next uh, major ruler that we're going to talk about is Charles Martel. He's going to rule the Frankish kingdom from 688 to 741. And he has this sweet nickname, Charles the Hammer. Um, because what he is going to do is he's going to, as Islamic forces, as you see on this map here, the Umayyad kingdom of Spain is going to be pushing up into the Frankish kingdom. And there is going to be a significant battle right here at the Battle of Tours. Um, and what's going to happen is Charles Martel is going to then push Muslim invaders back in to the peninsula and we're not going to see Islam really push forward into um, Western Europe more than just on the Iberian Peninsula. So a pretty big deal as we are looking at Charles Martel um, with his sweet The Hammer nickname, not to be confused with Thor, although that's really an interesting thing since they once worshipped a god named Thor. So someone can look that up if you'd like. But Charles Martel, 688 to 741. But the most important Frank that we're going to talk about is going to be Charlemagne. Charlemagne, if you haven't noticed from all our pictures here, they all kind of have this similar little, I'm going to hold this guy and this. I don't know if I should carry some sort of sweet uh, staff like that as I teach, but that seems pretty cool, and it's in all of the pictures, if you guys remember. See, there it is again. And back here, sweet staffs all around as we are looking at the different rulers in Western Europe. Now Charlemagne 742 to 814, he's going to reunite um, most of Western Europe, so that's going to be pretty significant. He's going to um, father, follow after his father, um, which we've talked about before. Um, his Charles Martel is going to be his grandpa, so his dad is going to be in between them, and then there's him. And so he is going to reestablish really even more so than before kind of the centralized imperial rule that we're going to see in Europe. Um, he is high energy. He is going to be one of those rulers that we kind of look back and say, like, look at all of his personal accomplishments. And so he is going to continue this reign, and he's going to establish something called Missi Dominici, which um, means messengers of the Lord King. So we've kind of talked about this before in other classes where we have something like this. Um, and we oftentimes call this some sort of like eyes and ears of the king. And now he's not a king, um, but he's creating kind of these messengers, these people that are going to go out and be able to report back to him. So once again, really getting this type of centralized control back in Europe. Now, um, there's going to be, during his time, kind of, a lot of people will call this, and this is uh, a fancy term, but the Carolingian 
uh, Renaissance. So you may see this, and this refers to Charlemagne, uh, but Carolingians, but the Carolingian Renaissance will be his kind of bringing art and learning back, but it's going to be centered around the Catholic Church. And so that's kind of a big thing to be looking at. It's not a secular renaissance. It is really focused upon um, the church, and we're looking at art through church. And so when we're thinking of the building of churches and the architecture that's going through this. Now, his empire is going to fall less than 30 years after his death, but for this period of time, we kind of have a renewal of centralized power under Charlemagne. And what's really interesting as well is kind of what's going to be happening on Christmas Day in the year 800. So in 800, oops, we don't want that. In 800, we are going to see that he is going to be um, with the Pope. And so he's going to be in St. Peter's, which is the church that we are going to find in Rome. And that is where the Pope is. And what we're going to see is while he's there, um, he is going to be kneeling in prayer before the altar. And so we kind of see what's going on. This picture is kind of a reenactment, which doesn't really give it uh, what really happened. But he's kneeling before um, the Pope. And what had happened is Pope Leo III suddenly places a good old crown on the head of Charlemagne while he's praying. And then kind of shouts out that Charles, because Charles is part of the name, Charles Augustus, remember Augustus being in the title of the Roman Emperor, um, and they called him like he was the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And so we see that he is dubbed this title, um, on Christmas Day, um, by the Pope as a way of like, hey, we've really reunified during this time, um, but there is going to be some tensions as he is going to be called the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, but there will be some tensions with the Byzantine Empire uh, over kind of this what is happening in Western Europe. Now, as we remember before, though, this after his death, um, things are going to be split between his three sons, and it's never really going to maintain a unified rule in Europe. Um, other things that are going on, there's another group of people that's pretty important to be thinking about. Um, this is kind of the rise of the Vikings. And now the Vikings are going to be Scandinavian. They're going to be kind of part of northern Europe, usually kind of of Norway, Sweden, Denmark area. Um, and what they're going to be known for um, is going to be the longship or the longboat, um, kind of talked about in both ways. So sometimes you'll see it as the longboat, which you see a picture of right here. Um, this boat is going to be really different um, in that it's going to be fast and that it is not significantly deep. It's able to kind of go up and down rivers really easily. Um, switch directions without a lot of problems. They don't have to necessarily turn around. And so what they were known is they kind of had this hit-and-run tactic of attacks um, where they can kind of come up the river, quickly attack small bands of people, um, and run around with their bounty. A lot of times they were known for plundering and burning, killing or enslaving the people that they conquered, um, but they were really known for their surprise attacks. And so the Vikings became a group of people that uh, people needed protection because they were going up and down different rivers throughout Europe. And so we start seeing that there's a lot of different groups that are coming in. So we just talked about the Vikings, and we can kind of see in the purple where they were going, the Magyars and the green over here. And then we also have different Islamic control, which we know is in this region. We also know that it's going to come into the Iberian Peninsula. Um, and then we have our Byzantine Empire, which is not moving into Central Europe um, but kind of blocking some of that. And so the whole system in Europe and the political system that was developed, um, what we're going to be calling feudalism, as we talked about in class today, um, this is going to be the system that's going to uh, be very present in Europe during this time. And just to kind of review what this is going to look like, we are going to have kings and nobles 
um, who are going to give land, which we know as fiefs from vocab today, um, to vassals. Vassals are going to be the people that are going to uh, be in control of this and then offer back, as we know, um, different military service. Now, control of land was hereditary. Hereditary, remember, hereditary means, when we're looking at this, based on family, not based on family. Okay, so based on family and not based on um, necessarily like achievements in your life, very different than China, um, where you can kind of work up in that way, but basically based on your families. Now, vassals gave the land to knights, and then they then would get the land, but then they would exchange military service. And so these knights would be protecting people. Um, they would not be in charge of like farming per se, but their service that they offer is going to be protection. And so they get food um, from people that farm the land. They offer protection and they have this unique little system. Now, it wasn't as organized as we'd like to think it was. Um, as we kind of look at the feudal system, we'll skip that one, um, where people kind of go into this uh, relationship together. Um, what we're going to know is homage. And what it looks like, if I go back and I draw you a sweet picture, we're going to see how this goes. Um, but where people um, enter this agreement of homage. So we have two major people. We have the Lord. And homage is when a vassal declares loyalty to a lord. And so what we're going to see happen here is they are going to offer, and a lot of times what would happen, and there's no way I can really draw this, these two would hold hands, and I want you to picture this. They hold hands, and then this guy is going to repeat this, and here you go. This is a ceremony where they're declaring their loyalty to each other. He might say, Sir, I enter your homage and faith and become your man by mouth and hands, and I swear and promise to keep faith and loyal to you against all others and to guard your rights with all my strength. Now, if you're anything like me, when we're looking at this picture, they're holding hands here, back and forth, um, and he declares this statement to him, uh, it's pretty stellar because it sounds a lot like a wedding, if anything. So they hold hands and they declare their loyalty to each other. Really it seems similar to a marriage, but we see how important it was um, that they declared their loyalty to each other, especially when we're thinking about how there was so little centralized power. And so there needed to be a way where people could remain safe. And so this is a really serious vow that people took. And so if you're looking at kind of this whole system, it relied mostly as we go this way of loyalty and um, military support. So they're going to pledge loyalty to the people above them. And then this way, the king and the lords are going to be offering land and protection to the people. And it's going to be kind of like this two-way relationship. And so this is where we have the rise of the knights, just like we had the samurai in Japan. And then when you're thinking about having to protect yourself, this is when castles came in with moats and these great walled buildings. Instead of walled cities, we actually had walled buildings, and so people could remain safe within them. Um, and that's why we have the rise of castles. Chivalry is really, just as we talked about the other day, is a code of ethics for knights. They promise to defend the church defenseless people, treat captives as honored guests. Um, they fight for glory and not for material rewards. And the really unique thing, um, because they're, at some points during um, medieval times, there wasn't a ton of fighting and there weren't some invaders. And so what happens sometimes, and this is kind of what we see if you've ever seen um, the children's version of Robin Hood, um, but there were different, like, uh, events where they could kind of show off their skills as knights. And so then we would see kind of the rise and jousting and events where they would kind of show off their skills um, and to win over the hearts of the dames and ladies that are there. And so uh, that's what chivalry is. And so we'll see kind of people fighting, um, not for real, but just kind of in competitions uh, when things were not as dangerous during that time. And so not only is feudalism really a political system, but manorialism, manorialism is going to be 
an economic system, okay? So when we're looking at this, that is terrible writing, but an economic system um, where serfs then are required to work for their lords three days of the week. The rest of the time they can kind of work on their own small plots of land that were given to them. Um, agricultural manners were essential for maintaining the feudal system. The manor was kind of like that plot of land, and in that plot of land there would be parts where there would be the mill and the church all kind of on the land, and so you can draw that. You can't draw it at the church. Um, and a mill, and then there would be the lands for the different groups of people. Um, and so they could go shopping. There's the store. Excellent drawings. Um, and so that's kind of how it went. And so a manor would be this larger group. And even as you can see from this picture up here, there'd be like kind of the place where they could live. There would be the different fields that people would work. And together, it would be a very self-sufficient area. Um, serfdom in itself, as we already talked about, people were bound to the land. They cultivated land for their lords in exchange for protection. Um, and they were also responsible for weaving and building. And so this was the system that they developed. And this is how Europe was for a long period of time, with the exception of the Franks that kind of had this small period of time when they kind of had um, centralized control. A lot of the Middle Ages, people were very decentralized people, um, kind of stuck together in smaller groups. And we're going to see the rise of guilds um, and different workmen groups. Um, but for this time, this is kind of what we see throughout Europe.